Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, One Voice Washington, D.C. Federal Government Policy Update. Uh, my name is Paul Nathanson. I'm with the Policy Resolution Group. Uh, I am going solo today as uh, Caitlin Sickle is, is unavailable. Uh, as always, this uh, webinar is brought to you by uh, both the Franklin Partnership, or uh, your advocacy uh, and lobbying firm, and the Policy Resolution Group at Bracewell, which we do strategic communications. We appreciate you joining us today. We've changed it up a little and made this a different day of the week, and, um, uh, and we're glad to have you all here. Um, today, we're going to be talking, we're going to provide some federal regulatory updates, uh, give you an update on the, uh, uh, there's been some developments on the trade front, including the 301s, uh, also some updates on the supply chain and some new data, and then we'll take your questions all in the next 30 minutes. Uh, we're going to start out by uh, Omar giving us a um, some information on uh, uh, the delays, the ERTC delays and scam warnings. That's the employee retention credit. So it's, this is an important update. Uh, so uh, please give Omar your attention. Omar. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. And as always, folks, you can please type in your questions into the right-hand side in there, and we'll try to answer them as we go if it's relevant to the slide or take them at the end of the presentation. As Paul mentioned, we'll try to keep it to an hour. Before I turn it over to John here in a second, wanted to flag something on which we've been lobbying and working the last few weeks since it was brought to our attention. The earned, excuse me, the employee retention tax credit, the ERTC, is something that we lobbied to create during the pandemic and then lobbied two more times to allow those that also claimed a Paycheck Protection Program loan that was forgiven to also continue to take the ERTC for employees that they kept on payroll when they were also suffering through those areas. Uh, then instead, what we also saw moving forward there, we also lobbied to expand it to cover nonprofits as well. So the ERTC is something on which that we've been lobbying quite a bit. We wanted to flag two things here in one, in one of the more to important topics in this 30 minute presentation that we cover here. The ERTC, we've been hearing a number of reports of delays from our members who had claimed the tax credit. And there's quite a few of them that we know that did claim it, we specifically lobbied for it. What we're hearing is 12 to 18 months is typically the norm right now for a refund for you to receive that ERTC from the moment filing. We've got a couple of folks that have now started to file inquiries. We've been trying to help a couple of specific entities working through their members of Congress and trying to work through the IRS Office of Advocacy there to try to get things moving along, those that just hit that 12 month part. But we are hearing from folks around town that it is a 12 to 18 month time period for so those of you that are trying to get it on your books either this year or thinking about when you might be able to take and address that refund please put it out to your cfos and to your cpas that that's at least what we're hearing and we're trying to get uh, we're working with the ways and means committee staff the tax writing committee to try to put pressure on the irs to figure out what is such of the holdup and part of it honestly is what we're seeing right here the irs just put out a warning on october 19th to be aware of third-party promotions of improper ERTC claims where these charges will large will charge an upfront fee or a fee contingency based on what you're bringing in. You might see some try to claim similar to the R&D credit or other type of scams that are out there. So be very, very cautious of that out there and just warning on some of the delays as you're trying to see some of the delays that are out there. But John, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you if you wanna go ahead and cover the SBIC. So it's been around for some time now. Yeah, uh, uh, Administrator Guzman made it made an announcement recently to to some reforms in the SBIC, the Small Business Investment Corporations. She wanted to expand access to SBICs and strengthen the diversity of at the SBA. Specifically, she was focusing on barriers to entry for private partner partner private public partnerships, and she specifically identified it identified barriers to entry where it, there's intensive capital investment industries. And so uh, she wants to make it easier for the, the SBAC is a private public partnership between the SBA and the, and the private sector to provide funding. And they just wanted to make it easier for the uh, private sector to be eligible for SBIC funding for capital intensive industries. Yeah, the reason we put this in here is because we are increasingly hearing about during transitions when companies are looking to either sell or they may not possibly be a next generation, there are increasingly opportunities to partner for these kinds of partnerships that are there. Again, as I alluded to, 
to John there. This isn't new. This has been around since the 1950s. It's not a new start. They're trying to expand it to improve the eligibility and access to give businesses more options than simply either closing their doors or selling to a large multinational. And this way, they could probably be able to keep it more domestically and in-house. Uh, John, we got another SBA update, though, similar to what we've seen on, on previous ones. Yeah, uh, they also we, we noted, saw that SBA is now the agency that will certify veteran, veteran-owned businesses, disabled veteran-owned businesses and such. And essentially, it is for those who are doing federal contracting. It will impact those who have set-aside programs, through the, for example, through the ADA program or sole source contracting, that it'll be, the, the, they have eliminated self, self-certification you know, and the SBA will be the one who makes a determination what is a veteran-owned business. Okay, so a bit more on this one as well. Uh, what they are, this is continuing a trend over the SBA that started a number of years ago, about three or so years ago, with regards to certification of women-owned businesses. And there was a, a number of about three different outside groups that you could go towards, that you could go and get a certification, that you, you'd self-certify and provide a very, very limited data. And obviously that could be rife with fraud. And similar to the VSOBs and SDVOBs, what you're seeing here is similar. They're removing that self-certification. It's gonna be run under SBA and entirely removing it from the Department of Veteran Affairs. So now they've done it to S for small businesses. They've done it for women-owned businesses and they've done it for SBVOBs. And that's why it's important for government contracting. For those looking at points, you're gonna to have to look at a new certification. If you do fall in on one of those categories, minority women-owned business, uh, service disabled, veteran-owned small business, any of those, you certainly should be, and you do any kind of government work, please make sure you've done and gone through the government uh, certification process. We've provided background and guides to women-owned businesses on that in the past and help you, happy to do so in the future. But back to, to John on some of the regulatory one, we lobbied on this one a number of years ago, even under the Trump administration when this law came through. This is the benef- benefit, uh, beneficial ownership rules, and the Department of Treasury just I- introduced a proposed rule that, when completing the beneficial ownership rules, you know, with the with FinCEN, the Financial Crime Enforcement Network, that if they're the entity that is filling out the paperwork must identify themselves to FinCEN that they are the ones completing that work, and the beneficial owners individually need to report certain specific information, name, address. A specific taxpayer ID number um, to of all the beneficial owners. Yeah, we lobbied with NFIB. We just emailed them yesterday morning when we saw that this popped out there as well to bring it to their attention since we did work on this quite extensively a number of years ago, starting in 2019 when the concept first came out there. It is significant. It is in law. It is in final regulatory phase, and that's where the challenge remains. And the joint employer side comments are now due on December 7th. We flag this every time we can, just especially because increasingly folks are using some kind of a staffing agency, temporary workers, those folks where you may not be the sole employer of that individual for a number of reasons. What the National Labor Relations Board is doing is accepting public comments. This is a reversal. Back in 2015, President Obama at the time took moved forward with the joint employer standards that would effectively make both companies liable in the case that one or the other potentially took a negative action, took some type of discrimination. And you see down at the bottom, the highlight here is indirect control, indirect control over the essential terms and conditions of employment when analyzing joint employer status. So now if you have indirect control over the employee, that potentially makes you a joint employer with another party that you didn't intend to be. Obama put this in in 2015, Trump took it out in 2020, and here we are again in 2022. Both PMA and NTMA will be filing comments through our Coalition for a Democratic Workplace, and that is one of the coalitions with whom we've been working for a number of years on this issue, and we did go back to 2015. For those of you that do have temp agencies, staffing agencies, please keep that in mind. That's a new rule that will be likely coming into effect once we see the final working through this process next year. But over the EEOC, got a new poster that's just was updated a couple of days ago. Yeah, know, know Your Rights poster issued by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, interestingly, they issued the poster originally on October 19th, and then they issued a revised poster on October 20th. And here is the link uh, for, the, for the poster. Make sure you print it off and put it in, make sure that that new poster is available in your shop. We also, there's additional um, NLRB rulings that they, that they said that uh, employers cannot unilaterally stop the union, union dues checkoff when, collect, when the collective bargaining agreement expires, essentially 
the NLRB says if a collective bargaining agreement expires, they assume they're going to continue negotiation, and therefore the union dues checkoff must, you know, must be must be maintained. So yeah, it means they have to keep collecting the dues even correct, after yeah, the collective yeah. bargaining. So that's yeah, and it, it does re reverse a previous decision, but it is but it is a union change. Also, uh, the, the number of 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 companies or who are or people who are petitioning for a, a union representation has increased by 35 percent we're also seeing unfair labor practices cases increase by 19 percent i think in, in fiscal year 2022 there were 18,000 unfair labor practices the nlrb and department of labor has also streamlined the approval process for the for the election for the election process and this is the highest number of new union cases filed since 2016. Thank you. Uh, we just had a question that came in about would you be to would you post the employment poster? Yes, there is a link on that slide that was just underneath the image of it and that is a live link that will take you there. When the when we do send out the presentation it usually goes out in a couple of hours, you'll be able to have a copy of it and be able to go through the entire thing. But absolutely that link will be in there for you. A couple of other things here on the regulatory front. OSHA, as we've discussed in the past, is starting to develop its indoor and outdoor heat index rule. When the heat index reaches 80 degrees Fahrenheit, indoor or outdoor, OSHA is intending to potentially have additional requirements for uh, personal protective equipment for PPE, administrative controls, engineering controls, uh, require some breaks and water uh, based on certain amount of hours work and the temperature that's outside. They've been in the process of, we've testified and spoken to it before a number of panels back in May, also before OSHA themselves directly at the highest levels in July, and also a number of other meetings that are coming up. As you'll see here on November 17th, they are moving forward on the National Emphasis Program for Outdoor Heat-Related Hazards and Programmed Inspections. This is different from the heat rule. The heat rule is the one that they're currently working on that is not in effect. What we wanted to phrase, uh, post to you here is show that the National Emphasis Program that is currently in effect since April 8th is something that's an ongoing part of discussions as they see how they might further implement that heat rule and use this as the foundation for that there. Lastly, uh, on the lead side, this is EPA is starting to release its national lead strategy and it's, it's long awaited and might not be a direct impact to some of our manufacturers, but on the downstream side and upstream, even from your supply chain, you might end up seeing additional changes there. Uh, lead NAAQS, this is a national ambient air quality standard. They're looking to complete that in 2026, but also on the emission standards for lead sources. And this is what could affect the secondary lead smelters. This could affect the cost of some primary copper smelters for some of those that are using uh, the downstream uh, products from that supply chain, the raw materials, same with steel manufacturing, those new rules they wanna see out in 2023 and 2024. And so watch for that and seeing how some of your suppliers might need to react and what new changes in their processes they might have to put in place, similar to the decarbonization initiatives that the Department of Energy is also pushing. And then lastly, aircraft, as you can see, that's nothing new we've been warning about there as much a bit. But let's just jump over to, to trade. John, I spoke to the folks over today, then they, they just released inspections. Yes, they just released a quadrennial um, advanced manufacturing strategy. That, that is out. There's three primary goals in that strategy is to address technology, to improve technology, to grow the workforce, and to build a supply chain resil resiliency plan um, that will prevent you know, uh, uh, conflicts in the supply chain that we saw during the pandemic. Along with those three goals, there are 11 st strategic objectives. They're all outlined in 37 technical recommendations moving forward. So this is something that's in effect for the next four years. And we will, we do expect, uh, this is something that we've worked on to make sure that there was, that the, that Congress did force administration to develop a national, a national manufacturing strategy. But as part of the supply chain, Omar, there's yeah, a lot of- yeah, Before we leave that, there's a lot more color to this as well. Uh, so yes, we did actually create this. Was, we were part of the lobbying coalition, not coalition. There were a few of us and a few senators that worked on this to make sure we actually had some kind of industrial strategy here. But we have been in direct contact with the National Institute for Standards and Technology. They're in the process of seeing how they can further incorporate industry into a number of these pillars. As you can see within the 11 there, there's a number of areas 
that we can help them with with regards to expanding the manufacturing talent pool, looking at advanced manufacturing education and training, strengthening connections between employers, educational organizations. Those things are, are right in our wheelhouse. So we had a, a pretty in-depth conversation with him on that. In addition to how to develop innovative materials and processing technologies, there's another area that they really do want to focus on is the digitization of the supply chain where you can more easily and quickly be able to see the vulnerabilities. And the folks over at NIST have offered to do some kind of webinars or briefings for folks in the industry to see how they can better meet the needs and further incorporate not just the associations, but also the private companies that will be conducting even some of the R&D and participating as stakeholders in these private partnerships. So please reach out to, to Roger Atkins, Bill Padnos on the NTMA side, David Klotz, Christy Carmigiano on the PMA side, and we're happy to try to make some connections there wherever it's relevant, because there's a lot of money coming out of NIST, a lot of money coming out of the federal government. We do now have a new announcement from the Department of Energy for the $2.1 billion for the battery belt. And don't know that this is as shovel ready as possibly the administration might be letting on, but it is important to show that they are moving forward and putting money across the areas. And please note, where are they putting these battery facilities? I don't see any in my home state of California, I don't necessarily see any on the coastal states there. And you can see how they're gonna to try to use the industry and the moving forward of advanced manufacturing in ways to anchor communities that haven't traditionally seen the investments of some of the other Silicon Valley types in the previous decades. And that's been part of our presentations lately in emphasizing the public-private partnerships, the corroborations, and creating the consortium locally so you can begin thinking about how you can apply for some of the government funding that's gonna be out there. But John, speaking of government funding, they are moving uh, pretty quickly out here, continuing on the CHIPS implementation. Yeah, uh, as you said, uh, CHIPS is slow, slowly but rapidly being being implemented moving forward. The program office, the CHIPS program offices, continue to look for input from manufacturers on how best to implement the, this CHIPS bill. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology is also looking for input in how best to implement the the, the manufacturing USA institutes that were that were included in the in the chips legislation, and so as the weeks and months go by, more and more meat will be put on the bones of this of the of the chips legislation that was put forward. But they are aggressively moving forward to implement the just chips bill. But the key point here is uh, getting your unique identifier number here on SAM.gov. Anybody that's done government contracting work in any way, you are familiar with this system. You are going to have to do some kind of registration. If you want to be involved in receiving direct funding under the semiconductor or any of the other grant programs that are coming out under the new law that was passed and that we lobbied on, you should probably at least start getting into this process, even if you want, especially if you want to be a stakeholder and maybe one of the groups that goes ahead and applies for you, whether it's training money or to do additional research yourself and R&D down the line. So you wouldn't have to do this for any of the tax credits or provisions, but if you did want to move forward with some of the grants, that's why they're giving you a heads up to start looking into that because they've already started to put out questions on the RFI so that way stakeholders can start getting a better sense of what and if anything that they may want to be involved in with regards to receiving input for the request for information that the Department of Commerce has now put out with submissions due here on November 14th in two weeks from today. In many areas, what they're looking for is feasibility, what kind of partnerships they can do, where how it is going to be most cost effective, what are those that can be commercialized most quickly. So there's a number of areas if you want to go through and you're interested in those areas. And then lastly of the new laws, we've already mentioned this a few times in our August presentation, but want to put a little bit more meat on the bones as you get towards the end of the taxable year and beginning of January 1st. The IRS is seeking input on six specific new and expanded tax incentives that were expanded under the Inflation Reduction Act or created under that new climate change law. These are a number of these are pretty significant for our manufacturers. Advanced manufacturing production credit is the one that would allow those that are manufacturing components for renewables, meaning components for solar, wind, offshore, wind, onshore, hydro, thermo, those would be eligible for a 25% advanced manufacturing production credit. And they're currently accepting comments on those for the next, uh, next couple of weeks or so before we move on into actually allowing them to go into effect. So please pass this along to your CPA and your internal CFO so they can start seeing which ones might benefit their business and how they can take advantage of. And then lastly, John, if you want to jump in here on the U.S. Trade Representative, they are going to start accepting comments here on the four-year review. Yes, actually, yes, it's been four years since President Trump implemented the 301 tariffs on China uh, back, I think it was in September, and we've talked about this in the past. 
that the USTA, USTR reached out to stakeholders. Should these tariffs be continued? Yes, there is. There was enough interest by industry, and so now this is the second step. They're going out to those who support and and and, and those who utilize the 301 tariffs for for a for a full four-year comprehensive review of these tariffs. Omar and I continue to believe that we don't believe any substantial change in the tariff structure will take place prior to the presidential election in 2024, but there may be some tweaks in it. And the USTR is opening up a portal, a comment period, that'll start on November 15th and conclude on December 17th. And we will, be, we will definitely be filing comments um, on this, on, on, the 301, on the 301 tariff issue. But Omar, I mean, it does show that tariffs do input impact behavior. Yeah, they they definitely do. Again, for whoever's interested in filing comments, we'll make a we'll make a link available at a, a later time when that portal does open and they provide more information on November 1st today. They're supposed to be releasing more information on the questions that they would like stakeholders to answer. They have not released that as of late last night when we previously checked on it. A quick couple of supply chain data points that we found interesting over the next few slides as we get ready to, to wrap up and we want to have one action item for those of you that just saw something come across your email at at 12 11 on actions on taxes and the, and the lame duck and we'll touch on that our business is decoupling from china we thought this was interesting in terms of the value of the yuan against the dollar as somebody who's lobbied on chinese currency manipulation now since about 2005 this is bringing back some some flashbacks as you can see of the number of of where that is in terms of the undervaluation against the u.s dollar and how that is going on with the Chinese economy, although they are starting to soften some of their zero COVID. So you might see some changes over that as well. Uh, I'll turn it over to Paul here. I, I know, Paul, you've been seeing and getting a lot of inquiries over from the media side on stories. Was as you take a look at, at this slide, if you want to say it looks like folks are increasing, have reshored more operations within the past three years, and they plan to reshore more within the next three years. Paul, what do you get? What kind of questions you get from the media? Well, I'm getting questions about, okay, we're seeing stories about uh, or statistics saying that folks have reshored. Uh, there was a big story in the Washington Post about uh, the, as the previous slide indicated, the decoupling of China and the United States, but uh, rep uh, reporters from some major media would like to get some examples of, uh, of um, manufacturing orders that have been reshored over the last six months to a year. So if you brought business back that was previously uh, uh, in China, you know, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to get on the phone with you to explain what the reporter's looking for. Um, it's major media uh, folks uh, to have a nice, and you know, perhaps you can have a nice uh, profile of your business and bringing back both business and uh, jobs to the to America. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, this is something on which NTMA especially is focused over the, in the last decade or so. So I, I really think that would be great timing, as well as you see some of the economies. We got the PMI number out today at 50.2 or 50.6, one of those things. Yeah, 50.6, I think it was from, from 52. Uh, but the general sense, at least that we're getting from some folks, is that just might be still working through and on the back end of, of what the backlog is. On there, we we're we're strange. So we read Federal Reserve Bank. We like to look at Dallas, Kansas City is another good one. Chicago is also very good when we want to get a sense of certain certain activities. But we thought that this study that was done by the Bank of Dallas was pretty interesting in terms of foreign-owned plants in Mexico, and you get a sense of the supply chain uh, production that's going on there with the maquilladoras and the number of employment that's there. So there's a later time, nothing to dwell on too much. But those that do have interest, especially if you're in automotive. There might, there's, it's a very quick read and it's some got really good statistics in there, such as you can see how low Mexico wages continue to attract foreign manufacturers. And you can also get a trend line of this is post the new NAFTA with that $16 per hour labor requirement, at, in addition to some of the content requirements that are in there. And you can see the real dollars per hour that are going in, uh, those that are either on the phone, the orange line here, $2021 into the United States is $34.74 an hour, whereas in Mexico in $21, it's $6.57 in the real dollars per hour. And that continues to obviously be a factor for this feasible future. And then the changing parts uh, on here on electric vehicles was another one that the Bank of Dallas put out. Nothing that you already haven't seen from experts, a lot more uh, into this than, than John nor I. So quickly, just more relaying information than trying to, to validate it, just giving you what the federal government's bankers are starting to look at and how it potentially might be impacting it. And lastly here, 
We did get some job numbers a couple of hours ago that we wanted to flag here. We look at durable goods. Those are the products that actually are going to last. And 473,000 job openings is currently what we're ranking in here. That is down slightly from 514,000 job openings in August of 2022. But the important thing is you all are, are still hiring from the sense that we're getting from at least the numbers and the antidotes that you keep telling us. Uh, Paul, do you want to jump in here also on some one more couple of media slides and what's going on on, on steel before we turn it over to John on Lame Duck? Yeah, it seems there's more attention now, back to more attention being paid on steel and aluminum. This is just a letter to the editor that I co-authored with uh, Louis Leibowitz, who was a, a trade lawyer here in town. Um, this was in response to a Republican uh, representative, uh, Henserling, who wrote an op-ed in the uh, Wall Street Journal talking about the importance of trade and the importance of access to uh, raw materials and we just um, pointed out uh, regarding the damage that the 232 tariffs continue to do on u.s manufacturers it was a good opportunity to get into the um, national media and speaking of uh, trade and tariffs this is your latest uh, steel benchmarker uh, steel price survey um, there was a big article in the wall street journal that i think many of you probably saw uh, in the last uh, day or so regarding the fact that steel prices, according to the domestic steel industry, are at its lowest point in two years. As I don't have to remind you that two years, uh, two years ago, uh, there was the beginning of a, a, a giant spike. Right now, steel prices in the U.S. are, um, are uh, higher than Europe, the second row there. So they're, uh, if you could go back for one sec, Omar. If they are, um, uh, they are $173 more. This is hot rolled steel than um, than Europe, and 366 uh, more. Actually, I think our slide is cut off. The important point here is that last column on the right hand side is the uh, is the uh, uh, capacity utilization rate the uh, of the domestic industry. This has uh, been starting to slide. The actual number this month it's cut off. Uh, this report. Uh, which is every two weeks is down to 74.8%. As you may recall, the justification for the steel tariffs back in 2018 was that that number has to be around 80%, according to uh, the Commerce Department, and this was the Trump administration. Um, that number was hit about 81, 82% for a while, but it has been trending down as the steel market has softened due to obviously uh, um, steel prices and some other domestic supply, um, steel tariffs and other domestic supply issues and the fact that the domestic in, uh, industry can't keep up with demand. So I know that uh, several folks have been reporting some uh, issues with uh, trying to find steel. So just to be aware of that, it's starting to gain attention again in the national media. On aluminum prices, same thing, we're starting to see attention. There was some um, uh, stories, some indication that the, uh, that the uh, Trump that the, sorry, the Biden administration may uh, Im, may uh, ban uh, aluminum imports from Russia, uh, which was causing some concern. They haven't taken that action yet. And in fact, on the other side, a, a group of Republican members of Congress sent a letter to the Secretary of Commerce asking why there are aluminum tariffs uh, remaining. Um, that there should that they should be removed due to the uh, uh, need for a supply of, of aluminum by U.S. manufacturers. So we are uh, keeping close watch on that. There certainly continues to be attention, and we want to get the information from you who are on the front lines and are the ones actually buying the steel and aluminum. So please let Omar, John, Caitlin, or I know uh, about your situation, and whenever you come across something interesting about steel and aluminum supplies, we're happy, we we would like to hear it. Yeah, latest rumors around here, at least, on the London Metals Exchange with regards to the Russians and the aluminum is no, they aren't going to cut them off and, and sanction them quite yet. It sounds like they're still pretty divided and they have been for a couple of months, but we were aware that we're going to be meetings meetings recently. But let's just jump to the lame duck. Uh, John, at 12, 11 p.m. Eastern time here just a few minutes ago, an action alert would have hit all of your inboxes coming from One Voice, calling for you to take action. So, John, tell them if they want taxes to go up and if they like paying more taxes, how they can do nothing. They just absolutely do nothing. You know, uh, we're seven days from the election. In this webinar, we like to keep it policy related, but elections do have consequences. And we are expecting a very robust lame duck session after the election. 
both the House and Senate will come back and handle a number of issues. Probably the most important to us and to uh, NTMA and PMA members is an extension of, of the R&D tax credit. And we expect extension of the R&D tax credit, addressing bonus appreciation, the 163J is it to be considered in a in a lame duck tax package, along with a number of other issues that we will talk about. But as of, as Omar pointed out, as of 12:11 today, we issued an, an action alert, and we recognize that you are taking your time to to listen to this webinar. But the next step is after you hang up on this webinar, is you you open up that action alert and submit that action alert to your policymakers. This is something that's going to be rolling that we're that we're going to be talking about for the next three weeks. And when, when Congress comes back to session, we don't expect a resolution of a, this, these tax provisions until sometime in December. And so, you know, uh, appealing to your senators and members of Congress and make sure that they understand the importance of allowing you to take advantage of immediate R&D tax credit is so critically important for, for your industry. And uh, so I hope you'll each will complete that, uh, uh, that action alert that was just sent out today. Yeah, and as some additional background, as you're aware, the research and development tax credit has been switched to amortization over five years, beginning on January 1st of this calendar year. And that's something that's been used by about half of our members when we pull them every single year. So we do know it is of critical importance to you. It converted as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And so that's what you're looking at right now is dealing with the R&D tax credit for the next four additional years of being amortized and then ultimately going away in its entirety. The 163 to which John deferred to, that's the 30% business to interest deduction. But you won't be able to include and calculate the depreciation and amortization under the EBITDA. You'd only be able to get to the first three of it. And that's how you would be able to lose out and increase your tax vulnerability and liability there. And obviously, bonus depreciation phases down from 100% beginning and going down to 80% on January 1st of 2023. These are the trios on which that we're really focusing quite a bit. Democrats don't necessarily oppose, well, they certainly do not oppose the R&D tax credit, but they have other priorities of their own that they'd like to see expanded that could potentially bring the bill down. Or if they could, if they don't get their provisions in at minimum, then they would restrict the R&D tax credit. And that's why weighing in right now. And, and just to shame some of our One Voice colleagues a little bit, when we've sent action alerts in the past on taxes increasing, such as last year, we did not get a very high turnout. So we really need them to hear from you because as of right now, John and I are not getting as great in, uh, feedback from folks on Capitol Hill. They're just not hearing from the business community and especially on 163J, but also on bonus and R&D tax credit. So please take action, take a minute or so, just send it to your senator, send it to your, your representative, and it'll really help push this over the edge. We're hoping, that's really where, Don, I need you over the next few weeks or so here as well. But there's other ways you can stay connected, please. The One Voice podcast, we will be doing a special post-election analysis that will air probably around November 10th. We'll be recording it the day after. We don't know how much of the dust will have settled, John, by then, but we will try to give a little bit of an update there. But as always, please do what you can to support and donate the, to the PMA and the NTMA. The NTMA's Government Affairs Administrative Fund and the Advocacy Fund of the PMA go towards supporting programs such as this and our activities here in Washington, D.C. continuously on your behalf. And we include you, encourage you to continue doing so. And please, please do send out that action alert. We will be taking a look at numbers to see where we are to the, how that complements our lobbying campaign here. Uh, with that, we're happy to take any questions. In the, please type them in the right-hand side. We're at 12:33, so right about the half-hour mark or so. Any questions on policy? Anything that we left off? As always, feel free to email us directly or contact NTMA or PMA with any questions that you may have. We'll give folks just another second or so. In the meantime, please, if you haven't already, figure out where your polling place is. You know, obviously, you have, our election day is a week from today. It'll be on November 8th. It should be easy enough for you to find a place to go and to make that happen. If not, there is a link uh, all over the place. You can just go to a number of websites locally, and they'll be able to direct you to that area. Seeing no questions, thank you, everybody, for your time today. And as always, please let us know if you need anything, and we will talk to you next month. I believe the webinar will be on December 16th as we get around to wrapping up the lame duck session to provide you an update on where we are and what's happening with taxes. Thank you, everyone.